The following transmission contains unencrypted instances of explicit language. Shall we begin? Smiley the suspicious person. You won't know who to trust. Let's begin. Welcome back, fellow spy nerds, to another episode of the Spies Like Us podcast. That is, of course, the podcast where we discuss the representation of tradecraft on screens, large and small. We're on a large screen this week with me is my good pal, my good online pal, anyways, Fred Kennedy. Say hi to the say hi to the nerds, Fred. <laughs> hi, nerds, <laughs> fellow nerds. Uh, we got a big one. We got a big one this week. You want to tell us what it is? Uh, Zero Dark Thirty. Um, about the whole plan to get um, Osama bin Laden. Which, from what I read of the notes you provided, was uh, when they started it, they were it was just going to be about the plan, not realizing that it was going to be successful. Yeah. That's true. That's true. We're going to get into that. Um I want to put some caveats up at the top of this episode. This episode is going to uh, hit some kind of controversial spots. It was a very controversial movie. Um, the the three main ones I just want to throw out to the audience. Uh, first of all, we are just amateur film critics. We're not professional journalists. Please don't rely on us to shape any of your opinions on the historical events in this in this film. But of course we'd be thrilled if there's things you didn't know about what happened. Uh, and, and if it launches into your own investigation, uh, that'd be awesome. Uh, also we're going to have a lot of Muslim names in here and I'm probably going to butcher, uh, all of them except for Osama bin Laden, which of course we all know how to pronounce. Um, also last, uh, just while this last month, while working on notes for this show, we we're already deep into it. Uh, Emir Al Qaeda, Emir Ayman Al Zawiri, Al Zawahiri, I'm gonna go with that one, uh, was killed in a drone strike in Afghanistan. Uh, we'll be addressing that recent event in comparison to this film because, interestingly enough, like this film is also about the assassination of an Al Qaeda leader. Uh, near the end of the episode. Uh, it is a 2012 film uh, focused on the hunt for Osama bin Laden. Featured agencies are primarily the CIA, uh, the United States Navy's Joint Special Operations Command, and uh, the red team of this film is, of course, Al-Qaeda. Although we are not in this film directly privy to their intelligence or counterintelligence activities in this film. This is one of those films where, you know, some, some films like to show you like what's going on on team blue, some stuff that's going on on team red back and forth here. We just, we really just kind of get a one-sided uh, point of view. Uh, Saudi intelligence is briefly mentioned as sharing information with the CIA. Uh, so, uh, this this new agency because I've never talked about them before on this podcast, uh, the the Navy's Joint Special Operations Command. That's the that's the guys that go in and and do the final operation here. Uh, they were founded in 1980. They develop and execute special operation missions worldwide. Wikipedia lists them having as having operated in Afghanistan, Iraq, Pakistan, Yemen, and Syria. Um, let's talk about, uh, Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. Why don't you, uh, jump us in on that, Fred? Well, that was the main reason why we went into Afghanistan. Uh, when we found out that he was a Saudi, first and foremost, he was a Saudi, but he was, um, started basically a terrorist, terrorist camp in Afghanistan and ran operations through there. And once we found that out, um, and after 9-11, that's when we started uh, the invasion to attack them and to find him, Um, which everybody understood and supported for the longest time. However, what complicated things, and we'll bring this up too with one of my second biggest tradecraft problems was 
and the movie gets into this. What I find it very interesting, the movie talks about Torah Bora, but it never lets on, okay? He was there, okay? He was in a cave in Torah Bora. And the movie lets on to they have intelligence about that at first. Mm. But I think its name is Dan Fuller, Pooh Poohs It. And they never really followed that up because, in fact, there are operatives to this day who say he was not only there, right, but on the cusp of getting him, President Bush, W. Bush, decided to um, switch gears and start a war on another front in Iraq. And there are those to this day who said we might have been able to get him in that cave in Tora Bora before he was allowed to escape over the border into Pakistan, where he, we find him later in uh, at Badabil or at Badabil or whatever the name that's of that a is. Little, that's a little bit further into the weeds than I wanted yeah. to get okay. quite, quite right. yet. But just, just laying the scene of like the act, like the, the players on the stage here. Uh, Osama bin Laden, of course, uh, as he said, Saudi national. Uh, went over into Afghanistan to help their insurgency against the uh, com- communist supported government of Afghanistan at the time. And, Which brings and, us to the old man. Exactly. So like we were talking about, like the events that we see in the old man, even though Osama bin Laden's not seen in those events, this is the time when he was learning his craft. You know, he hadn't formed Al Qaeda yet. Uh, during the events of the old man. But the main thing to know about Osama bin Laden is that like he's, you know, Sunni radicalism has uh, it had existed for a very long time. The real change with Osama bin Laden, he's the one that said, let's stop attacking the West's puppets as they see them. Let's actually start attacking the West. Um, yeah. And well, the other oh, thing too, that gets conflated is the difference between the Taliban, which was the in- indigenous Afghani people that were there, and Al Qaeda, which was a, a foreign group, um, primarily of Saudis and others, and that kind of um, confused things for the American public because uh, we kind of yeah, conflated the two, so. especially in the when we were trying to negotiate a way out, realizing we had to negotiate with the Taliban, and a lot of Americans found that hard to believe because the Taliban was not the same as Al Qaeda. Al Qaeda had basically been been chased out and we were left with the Taliban because those are like it or not bad guys or good guys. Those are the ones that were remaining and, and had to be negotiated with. So I think a lot of the confusion comes with conflating those two groups. Right. And uh, Al Qaeda at the time of the events of this film, Al Qaeda was a multinational Sunni jihadist network at the current time. I think we can, I think we can better regard them more as a brand than an actual operational force. Um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, historically, uh, so this film attempts to depict, it depicts a version of historical events, but uh, all the characters are renamed or amalgams of of each other except for all the except for bin laden and all the al-qaeda members for those for some reason the filmmakers decided to use their real names all the american characters are like fictionalized amalgams of real people like for instance maya and uh most of the background cast is listed only like by their title and by their names um Bigelow said she intentionally actually cast a, most of the people to not look like their real life counterparts. Um, I was a little iffy on that because I think Gandolfini does look kind of a lot like Leon Panetta, <laughs> in my opinion. Right? Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yep. Kind of the same same profile. I would I would I would mistake them for each other in a dark alley. Let's put it that way. Um, but uh, most people agree. Now, see, very specifically, so the main character, Maya, is definitely an amalgam. Um, I found multiple CIA sources while Googling who went out of their way to say that the cracking of the Obama's, 
Osama bin Laden case was largely due to the work of several very dedicated women in the CIA. Um, Most of them agree that Chastain, at least as Jessica Chastain's choose choice of like, like who to base her performance off of uh, is off of a uh, lady named Alfreda Francis Bukowski. Um. The Sufficiently Curious, if you want to look her up to, you might also want to Google the name Alfreda Schuer, which is her current married name, uh, and because that's the name that she's used uh, when she's made public statements about uh, this movie. Uh, when did you first see this movie, Fred? Um, years ago. I think I was in the theater. Um, you were t- say the, the whole thing about uh, Maya mm. uh, being, uh, you said the experts talk about it being a collective and a team effort that probably goes back to Hollywood always having to have a rugged individual hero, usually male. Um, so that could be part of that too, by putting most of it on Maya, even though it was a, a group effort. Although the, the film does try to show the, the collective group um, effort in trying to, uh, you know, track down the, uh, his uh, messenger does- and so on. So yeah, I think it does. I think it does that quite well. I think it does simultaneously, uh, definitely portray this as a decades long, huge group effort involving mm-hmm. hundreds, if not thousands, of people's yeah. work. Um, yeah. While while also giving us one character that yeah. we as a movie audience can kind of key in on. Yeah, but not. I didn't really walk away feeling like the movie made her feel like like it was just all her, you know? Like, oh, you could have, like, a crappier version of this movie would be one in which everyone was wrong about everything except her. You know, that yeah. kind of movie? <laughs> yeah. Well, you really, uh, they really portrayed that, I think, and maybe for dramatic effect, when she uh, out in the hallway there, let the station chief have it. You know? She really lowered the boom on him. And basically threaten him for a congressional hearing and so on if she didn't get her way. Uh, I don't know how I much did. that was for dramatic effect, but that was a pretty powerful scene. I did. I did like that scene. Um, I also saw this when it first came out in theaters. I really can't say that a lot of it really stuck in my my head. Uh, when I rewatched it for this podcast, I felt like I don't know. I guess just between then and now, I feel like I've just increasingly been become so much better informed about uh this whole situation like the war on terror in general at large Mm -hmm. that this movie uh made a billion times more sense to me and and it has been on our list to do for a very long time uh but my little sister just saw it and she wanted us to cover it so this one's for you carolyn i love you very nice uh, directed by Catherine Bigelow. Uh, her other most popular films include Point Break, Strange Days, and The Hurt Locker, for which she became the first woman to win win the Academy Award for Best Director. And she got to be, with those films, she got to be kind of a, one of the, not only a, a successful woman director, but a woman director who was very comfortable in the macho field of Point Break and and uh, Hurt Locker, and now this. In other words, being around kind of t- testosterone-laced kind of movies, you know, that oh she God. was very comfortable with. You're 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 so right. And and I've heard I've heard some critics describe Hurt Locker as like a film about men and their feelings that only a woman could tell. Yeah. <laughs> If if that makes any sense, and I, point break I maybe point break was yeah was was testosterone laced too, <laughs> a little and bit she, yeah yeah, and that was a yeah. remake. And so uh, you know, having broken that little glass ceiling, you know uh, that uh, that feat of uh, best woman director uh, that has been replicated twice since then. Um. So that's cool. I feel like we're on a, on a good path, but yeah, Bigelow, Bigelow definitely had like a lot of what it would have taken to be the first, um, you know, she was briefly married to James Cameron. Did you know that? And that's an interesting story because I'm not sure if you were aware with this, but in 2010, they were up against each other. 
Key for Avatar and she for um, the Hurt Locker. Hurt Locker. Did you know? Oh. Yeah. So oh, that yeah, was I the whole. No, I didn't realize Avatar was 2010. Yeah, that was the whole underlying storyline of that whole Academy Award is that she was up against her husband uh, for that. And then she won. Well, no one, no one was going to give it to Avatar. I, I can't imagine that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but that was the underlying uh, storyline of that Oscar year is that the two former um, husband and wife were competing with each other. Right. The thing is, and, you know, and not to get too deep into the, what, the Hollywood rumor mill or whatever, but even though their marriage was brief, uh, their friendship and their mutual professional respect mm-hmm. for each other yeah. uh, they has endured other. over the years. Yeah, exactly. They're like, they're, they, they often are like unofficial uh, advisors on, on each other, on their, on their yeah. stuff. So yeah, they're still, great. Um, yeah, they just mm-hmm. decided like, yeah, friends, collaborators, that's a good fit for us. Husband and wife, maybe not so much. Um. I do want to just really quick. I have to mention her second movie. I think it's my second favorite vampire movie of all time near dark. That was mm-hmm. her second film for which she borrowed. Like, uh, you know, you know how uh, Cameron has his old like, like group of uh, actors that he repeatedly uses. Yeah. Uh, Bill Paxton, Jeanette Goldstein. Yeah. Uh, that Lance Henriksen. Uh, mm-hmm. And that one other guy, like three of those people like showed up for her movie. Uh, near dark which was uh just a really really great vampire movie yeah low budget, it was low budget. you've seen it yeah and um but i'm a big Anne rice fan oh, i've read all of her books and fx is gonna finally take on the vampire chronicles i was Ooh. very disappointed yeah i was very disappointed in um the one they did before the interview with the vampire um the Vampire Lestat, when you read the books, I don't know if you've read the books. Not but, all of them, but several, yes. Okay. The Vampire Lestat is very, I just thought Tom Cruise, as good of an actor as he was, or is, I just thought he was miscast. The Vampire Lestat was a very androgynous, tall, long blonde hair, Robert Plant looking kind of guy. And Anne Rice wasn't thrilled at first. Finally, I guess he won her over. But this new series that's going to be on FX, Sam Raimi, maybe is the name. He's going no. to play Lestat. Oh wait, no. He's okay, to... Sam Raimi's a director. It's got to be something. All right, else. this guy does have long blonde hair, and he does look the part. And they have Lewis. And the great thing about those books is you get almost like Game of Thrones. You get point of view, right? Because when you read the interview with the vampire. You get Lewis's point of view, and when you when you hear Lewis talk about Lestat, you think Lestat has no redeeming qualities until you get the second book, The Vampire Lestat, and you get his point of view. It's like, oh, okay. It's kind of like Jamie in Game of Thrones, right? Jamie, you think, pushes that kid out the window. He is no, he's horrible, he's evil, he has no redeeming qualities. But then you read Jamie's point of view in Game of Thrones, and he's not so bad. So I love it when books do that. In movies, you know, you give you the point of view of the different characters. George Martin does a great job of that, I think. And I'm just so everybody keeps talking about uh, Game of Thrones and the Winds of Winter. He keeps claiming that he's going to be done. He's almost done with the Winds of Winter, but he keeps doing all these stupid side projects. You know, it's like go home and finish that book. You know, because everybody <laughs> was so, <laughs> everybody was so disappointed with the way HBO concluded the series but that's because they went they eclipsed him he stopped writing and they went ahead and wrote the series without him so i'm hoping that if he lives all right to write to not only finish winds of winter but then the last book he'll have a better ending i don't know if you've read the books or followed the series of game of thrones but um yeah yeah he's a great Uh, writer but he just uh, he, he takes on too many side projects and you got people outside saying, go home and write. <laughs> <laughs> people with signs outside his house. Yeah, yeah, screaming. It keeps going. It keeps taking on all these side projects, you know? So, I don't know. Uh, Sam Reed, by the way, Australian yeah. actor. Okay, is that is the one? Gonna, is Sam Reed? going to play a list at, yeah. That's um, the one, Sam Reed. 
Yeah. I don't know him from anything. The only, I did a quick look on IMDb. The only project I even like recognize the name of is 71. That's uh that oh, world war. Shoot. Was no, world Northern war one Ireland. Or world war two. No, I think that was Northern Ireland. 71. I think that was Northern Ireland, the British in Northern Ireland. Hold on. I'm clicking on it. I saw that. It was excellent. If it's the same. Oh one. Yeah. A young yeah, and disoriented a British soldier is accidentally abandoned by his unit following a yeah. riot on the deadly streets so, of Belfast. That sounds okay. awesome. It was good. It was very good. And um, so, yeah. So I just take it a I, look at him. I think my course, uncle was telling me about that film. So, yeah. Hmm. But I've always been, to, not that, I mean, I just, he, I thought uh, Tom Cruise was poorly miscast as Lestat. This kid at least looks the part. We'll see what he does with it, though. All right. Because well, um, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of FX in general, as you know, as a as a production house. Uh, yeah, you like the new logo general. too. I know. Yeah, that's right? true. That's true. <laughs> hey, they brought us the old man, dude. Right? Oh my god, that's one of the best I've ever seen. That movie is so well done, or that series. Um, yeah, you and I were both. You and I were both won over by the, by the daughter. And just she as you her. said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I've been, now I've been watching a lot more uh, Arrested Development, which is the show where she made oh, her big break. And yeah, yeah. She's she's. Did she I, show? You, did she show her chops on that? Now that you're you, looking in hindsight, you, you can see you can okay. you can see the sign you can see the signs. Uh, she's a, you know it's a it's a comedic performance, but yeah. like her main her main thing is like one of her main subplots is she's a teenager. But she is so incredibly ballsy that she like fools uh, movie execs into thinking she's a movie producer. Like she just sneaks on set and starts producing movies, oh. and uh, you know, and acts so mature that uh, everyone just like takes her word for it because she's so like in command of of what she's doing. Wow, um, how prophetic for for the old man! Huh? Sure, yeah, 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 yeah. She uh, was, uh, she's unbelievable. She about as far. I try to keep an open mind because I'm an old man, but the, um, who's the gal for, uh, Ozark Ruth blows me away. The gal who played Ruth in Ozark. I think she's incredible actress. Did you see Ozark? Haven't seen Ozark. Oh my God. The gal that plays Ruth is incredible. And, uh, Kathy Bates is another one who I think you don't even know she's acting. She's that good. Um, (laughs) but, but this one, um, in the old man, she's another. She's right up there. Her act. It's like you don't even know she's acting. She's that good. Just blew me away. I'm I'm a hundred percent with you on that. Yeah. As you mentioned before, a really interesting thing about this film is uh, they were working on. This was supposed to be a film about the failure to capture Bin Laden. Um, mm-hmm. And what they let me see. What did I? How close did they get? Uh, shoot. Um, Tora Bora. Yeah. Uh, the news he had been killed made it into an entirely different film on very short notice, but they had already done so much homework that they felt like they could turn it around uh, really fast. In fact, this being a, what what did we say? 2012 film and Bin Laden was killed when? Well, it was um, in 2010 was the Academy Award series. Or no, that was for the Hurt Locker. Sorry. So yeah, you're right. Yeah, it was May t- May second in 2011. So uh, yeah, that's a pretty fast that's a pretty fast turnaround, especially for a movie um, this mm-hmm. this gritty and uh, uh, what do I want to say? Um, very very particular yeah. and detailed documentary like too. Yeah, close to it. Yeah. Um, where am I at here? Uh, yeah, just a few more cast notes, uh, before we get into Tradecraft. Um, Jessica Chastain and Mark Strong are both making, uh, repeat appearances on the Spies Like Us podcast here, uh, because they starred together in Miss Sloan, uh, which is one of my favorite movies that we've covered, even though, you know, uh, it's one of those, like, it's kind of spy movie adjacent, but at the same time, it's just one of the best spy stories I've ever seen. Uh, mm-hmm. Highly recommended. Um, this film, Zero Dark Thirty, because it's got such a huge cast, 
And it's pulling in all these people that you you tend to associate with spy movies, like Mark Strong, for instance. I've ne- I've never seen him not being in a spy movie in some like capacity. It just seems is, to be. A is plane. he the one? Um, he is he the CIA guy in the room? I I think yeah I think he's the deputy director. Yeah. Uh, so he's, or no, 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 is no, he no, the no. one that? No, he's a se- well, he's a senior CIA supervisor is how he's listed. So he's is he the one that I think reminds me of Stanley Tucci? Ooh, I don't really know Stanley Tucci except by name. Oh. But he is the oh. one that comes into the one boardroom and like rips them all a new one. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. If you remember yeah, that, that part. Exactly. Um Yeah, I think that's the guy that I always confuse with Stanley Tucci. They I think they look a lot alike. So as far as uh, uh, so again, like this film has the most repeat performances that I've ever seen because there's so many people in it. Uh, so also Joel Ever- Edgerton is a repeat performance for us for Red Sparrow. Kyle Chandler, uh, who plays like her section chief that she uh, threatens with the thingy. Uh, he was in Argo. And way in the background, just in one scene, Stephen Delane, who's like the NSA uh, or wait, not NSA, like national security, but the, oh, let's see. What do you call it? What's the other NSA? See the wolf? No, but he's the national security advisor. And oh, he, the one that they, they had the argument in the hallway with about, he said, he, you got to give me more. They, they did have that argument. He's also the one that Mark Strong, like Mark Strong is really like sitting at the table, having to make the case to this guy. Cause this right. guy is the guy that's going to go and then talk to the president. Right, exactly. He says, you got to give me more. Yeah. Right. And right. I only barely noticed him because he was just slightly in this, but he was the main, like, kind of a uh, foil for Robert Redford in the movie Spy Game. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Mark Strong now joining the uh, three-peat circle for the Spies Like Us podcast. And this is the last time, this is the last time I'm going to bring up, like, second performances because now we have five five people mm-hmm in the three P performance. And I also just wanted to mention it this one last time, because this is something we've done for a very long time. It's just point these out, these actors we've seen in different uh, spy movies. And there were so many of them in here. I had to stress that, but now that we've got five people in the three Pete circle, Mark strong, you have just joined. Let me see. You join Robert Redford, Michael Lonsdale, Gene Hackman, and Jonathan price. You're in good company. That's there, not a bad, sir. yeah, that's not a bad crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so from now on, we're only going to bring up when people like make it into the three peat circle, or if someone ever gets the four peat. Which I'm kind of, I'm kind of betting on Michael Lonsdale for that because someday we might do Moonraker, and I think I'm he's a, the villain in that. One. I'm a hockey fan, so we call that a hat trick. Three goals. Okay. Oh, sweet, sweet. Yeah. All right. Um, this was the first time I'd ever noticed Jessica Chastain. Obviously, I'm going to the theaters. Everyone's like, oh, my God, she's amazing. She's amazing. Yeah, I thought she was amazing for sure. Uh, Heavy favorite for best actress uh, for this role, Um, but loses it to Jennifer Lawrence. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder if that was for uh, the Bone, the Bone, Boneyard, some, her first movie. That might have been her first movie. Jennifer Lawrence got her got her Oscar for her first performance. Do you remember that? Not the one with those that was based on the books with the bow and arrow. No, no, no. <laughs> this this was before that. This okay. is a this is a movie basically about like uh uh meth uh oh meth what do you call them? Not farmers. They don't farm meth. Meth chemists in the Ozarks <laughs> kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah, Great. cooking them up in the kitchen. Great film, and I think Jennifer Lawrence is her first performance, and she just walks away with the best actress performance at 17 years old. Boom. I think she was the youngest she, at the time. Did you think she deserved it compared to Jessica? Or Oh, I'm going to say yeah. I want to say yeah. That, Some people, that, I've used to say, really I good. used to hear people say the whole best actor, actress thing is meaningless unless you had all those actors and actresses trying to play the same role. <laughs> then you could, then you can make a judgment, but even then it'd be subjective, subjective, but I've always heard that, you know, 
that it's kind of meaningless unless they all were trying to play the same role. Um, oh, sure, sure, sure. You know? Yeah. But, um, but uh, yeah, that's that's all my notes on the context and the and the you know the movie as a piece of art and the yeah. cast and stuff. Uh, if you've got any, if you've got nothing else to add, then we'll head into the briefing nope. room, start tearing okay. apart this tradecraft. All right, let's go. Retinal scan complete. Validating security clearance. Clearance granted. You may now enter the briefing room. So the film takes the most controversial part first and that's what we're going to talk about first we're going to talk about the uh torture and interrogation here i'm going to call this torture i'm not going to call it enhanced interrogation although that's what uh some of the um people on a certain side of the issue might call it mystically right uh i just want to make sure we're on the same page i believe from the texts that i've seen from you while we were talking about this show you would call this torture as well wouldn't you would you not Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So we're going to call it torture. Other people, they can call it what they want. Um, The torture that we're seeing is uh, of Amar al-Baluchi, and that is based on a real person. Uh, Wiki tells us this guy is believed by U.S. officials to have been involved as a courier uh, for the people that uh, actually did the operation of the 9-11 attack and that he is a key lieutenant of the masterminds of the attack amongst other things. Also, according to Wiki, he was tortured while being held extra legally in a CIA black site in Afghanistan. So that's what we're supposedly seeing in the film, right? Cause that, that is happening in Afghanistan. Um, Wiki Weirdly enough, Wiki claims that this torture did not yield the CIA any useful intelligence. Um, so then we got that perspective. I guess I want to look at this in, in through three lenses. First of all, Wiki seems to be mostly on the side of Amar Al-Baluchi. And then I pulled up at least one, just one... Um, Let's see. It was a Washington Post opinions column by Jose Rodriguez. And he gives what I'm what I take as like the CIA opinion of this. And and sandwiched in the middle there is just like what what do we see in the film? You know, like what would we think about this if if it had nothing to do with with reality? Um, What we see in the film, we see all not all the hits. We don't see some of the super weird, fantastic stuff like people being, you know, having their nipples electrocuted uh, or fingernails pulled out. But uh, we see sleep deprivation, starvation, body shaming, denial of military. Waterboarding. As well as bondage, stress positions, and extreme confinement. And And heavy metal music. (laughs) <laughs> oh, two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they used to use uh, uh, Rick Astley's uh, Never Gonna Give You Up as well. That'd do it. I would give up everything if I had to hear that. Um, Again, just talking about, for the moment, what, what, what I see in the film. Uh, the CIA torturer, Dan Fuller, uh, displays what looks to me like great competence and practice at his work. He seems to be highly experienced at it. He seems to be highly innovative and adaptive uh, to the to the changing situation and a, what I would call a terrifying ability to quickly shift from sympathetic to totally unsympathetic uh, back and forth really quickly in a kind of a confusing way that seems to me to be intended to keep the prisoner on his toes. Um, he's really really focused on the main question that he wants to ask here is like when is the next attack when is where and when is the next attack where and when is the next attack i want to give this minus spy points i don't think they had any reason to believe there was going to be a next attack i think that's just washington being very very uh narrowly focused on everyone wants to cover their ass and make sure there is not another attack or that they stop it in time um 
Another thing I noticed, which I I liked, and then and then a side element to that that I didn't quite like. What I liked is that he's the only person in the room that's showing his face to the prisoner. I think that is plus interrogation points if you're going to allow that. You know what he's doing is even legitimate whatsoever because I think that. He wants to be the only that just he wants to make sure he's the only human face that this person can respond to. I think that's very psychologically valid. Plus, when he makes his deal with the wolf, he said he's willing to go to bat before Congress to make the case for it because he says, I'm the one that's doing it. When he makes when he made the deal with the wolf, remember that? For to get I that money for the I, I don't Lamborghini. exactly think. Oh, okay. Okay. Can you, can you walk me through that a little bit? He goes to, and I don't know why he wanted the money till later. He asks for all that money, but obviously then we see later it's to bribe uh, the one Saudi to buy a Lamborghini um, uh, to get him wait, to identify the Saeed family. Right. Right. Wait, wait, wait. Not, not Saudi, but what was the small country that? Uh, oh yeah. Kuwait. Or, Kuwait. Yeah. Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti, Kuwaiti. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. So he he does that, and um, the wolf brings up the controversy of it, and he said, I, "I'll still go to bat for you um, because I'm the one that do, that's doing it." So that was kind of ballsy, right? Um, you you at this point in the notes, or at this this is at least where I wanted to. Uh, bring you in if if you're if you're following along with me this is where you wanted to talk yeah. about the mechanics of, of waterboarding because we're going to focus on that one specifically uh, well it's um it's a bit troubling to me because very quickly uh, describe how it works just in case just they, in case they hold the cloth they don't know they will hold it hold the cloth over the prisoner's mouth and pour water over the cloth so that it simulates a drowning effect. But as you said, the WikiLeaks report said it didn't yield any information and the CIA Rodriguez said it did. But I put down that and at the expense of getting ahead of ourselves, my worst tradecraft because of the morality of it, okay? Most, everything I've read about torture says that the person who's being tortured will say anything just to stop the torture. And the other thing I remember when this was debated, when this all came out with Abu Ghraib and uh, um, what's the place in Cuba? Guantanamo. Yeah. Where all, where the worst stuff was going on. The military brass are even against it because if our guys get captured, a la John McCain, who was mm-hmm. tortured and suffered in the Hanoi Hilton in Vietnam, the military brass has always come out against it because of what the implication would be for our soldiers and airmen who were caught behind enemy lines. So um, the weird thing about it is I took that as negative tradecraft because of the morality of it. But the, but the And I think you said the movie wants to have it both ways. Mm, a little bit because little bit. they want to say that it worked, but then they say it doesn't work. Um, so somebody could argue that that was positive tradecraft. If in fact it got the uh, life saving information out of the person who was being tortured. So that's, uh, that's kind of where I am with it. Right. Um yeah, so as far as her having it both ways, this is this gets a little complicated. And I actually, the more I thought about it and the more I rewatched it, uh, I think she might have been quite masterful in giving giving this as a Rorschach test. Because, uh, I mean, a lot of people saw this movie very different ways, walked out of the theater with with very different opinions. Some of them thought like, oh my God, yeah, this totally justifies... Uh, you know, all of our actions. And some people walked out thinking, oh my God, this totally proves that like uh, we were completely out of control and and full of shit. But a, a few things. First of all, I mean, she does uh, illustrate the the aspect of, of torture where 
you know, uh, he's saying he's just guessing at what the day of the attack is going to be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, and it's not stopping. So he's like, uh, Tuesday, like just anything, anything. Um, eventually in the movie, he does give the name Abu Ahmed, which Mm -hmm. is, was a very important name that they got. And the movie focuses on almost like almost exclusively, uh, so again, a good mix of like historical fact and uh, also giving us as an audience like some you know something to focus on and not get completely lost here. But then there's also the fact that uh, you know she kind of suggests like after he'd been I don't know uh, blown out of his mind so hard you know and and just so lost that she was like, well at this point we can just tell him anything. And then they have that scene where they're, you know, sitting down and having lunch with him. And they tell him, like, yeah, you don't remember? You you did a great thing. You gave up all the names. You stopped a bunch of terrible things from happening. Uh, we're so grateful. You should be proud of yourself. And it, it seems like the movie's implying that didn't really happen. So in the same way, like, they're kind of implying, like, the torture got them there. But they're also having this out of saying, well, no, it was actually like when they relented on the torture and tried Mm -hmm. a different tactic, that's when they got the name. But I can totally see how people could see it both ways. And I'm not entirely sure that Catherine Bigelow, because I have 100% respect for her that she didn't like really like want to have that needle threaded all, all those different ways. Um, I want to give I want to give the CIA criticism again I'm just going to quote a single source a single Washington Post opinions column uh, the source is Jose Rodriguez he's a 31 at the time that he wrote this anyways he was a 31 year CIA veteran who was in charge of the CIA counterterrorism, counterterrorism center from 2002 to 2004 now that's actually not a very long time. And notice that the events here of the torture, those are happening in 2002. So also it's a little suspect on whether or not he was actually in charge of the counterterrorism center when this torture was taking place. So that might be a little question on his like authority Plus, on the topic. Why would he, why would he lie? He's a member of the CIA. <laughs> yeah. Of course. You know, so I take anything, and I don't know anything about this guy, you know? I don't. Of course, of course. But I take anything that the CIA said with a grain of salt, because that's their whole modus operandi, right? They, I mean, as we talked about with the old man, this is an organization that overthrew democratically elected governments and then lied about it. So, you know, I consider the source. A hundred percent. I merely want to highlight some of the points that he makes uh, in in terms of like giving a, I don't know, uh, just presenting yeah. presenting the, I guess, a CIA perspective. Uh, I got, uh, let's enough. see, I, 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 I pulled out four of them. Um, yeah. He says, he says the brutality of the torture scenes, he says that's completely out of line with reality. He says that, uh, uh, and he's not denying, he's not denying that the well he's he is denying that some of the like stress positions and and stuff uh and dog colors didn't happen and he thinks the filmmakers took that from that unfortunate video that uh came out from one of the army bases in afghanistan i think well or just conflating abu Ghraib and gitmo too all that we saw there right so i'm to give him the benefit of the doubt maybe the filmmakers were conflating all the stuff there that we saw with the dog because there were dog collars there and all that stuff that we saw in Abu Ghraib and Gitmo. Right. Um, he also, he also believe he thinks that Fuller's impromptu, like ad hoc approach. Like there's one point he just says like, okay, we're just, we're just going to fucking waterboard you like right now. All right. And just like grabs a bucket of water and, and just holds him down on the floor. Uh, he says, he says, okay, like waterboarding happened, but not like that. And Mm -hmm. it was much more of a, had to like go through like a whole bunch of channels to get approval and, and 
everyone having signed off at all levels of government and the whole like cover your ass aspect of Washington makes that feel authentic to me. Like I could believe that he he said, he said CIA operatives had to go through it too, to, to appreciate the experience of it. Oh, didn't he say that as well? He, he actually says that uh, thousands of uh, people in the military undergo waterboarding as a, as a test uh, just, yeah. just by normal practice. And that they've found that there's no lasting physical or psychological effects. Of course, there's an enormous difference between your friends you know, and your commanding officer and in a whole very organized, very, uh, uh, controlled, controlled setting, you know, saying, yeah. okay, we're going to do something horrible to you. It's not going to last. And then, you know, a- as opposed yeah. to like this demon, this American demon, that's just like grabbing. But anyways, um, his description is again, like, it's not something that just Dan Fuller would have just been grabbing a bucket and just doing it. Of course, it's not to say that there weren't rogue people. I don't know about that. But uh, he says, you don't do it with a large bucket. You do it with a normal sized water bo- water bottle. And especially, this one was kind of weird to me. He mentioned that uh, the the subjects were on a medical gurney. And I, I really have spent a lot of time wondering why he chose that phrasing. Because on one hand, it kind of suggests to me, like if you tell me the the prisoner was on a medical gurney. It makes me psychologically imagine that there's like medical professionals in like white coats in attendance. That's a very sterile and surgical procedure. And that, you know, there's a doctor ready to like jump in and stop. Standing by. Right, right, right. But that's not what he said. He just said they're on a medical gurney. So I got two, I got two theories there. One is that there were doctors standing by and just when he was writing it, he just thought like mentioning that they were on a medical gurney was enough to tell us the truth of the matter. The other is a little more sinister, which he thought like, well, if I mention the medical gurney, then that's where the reader's minds will go. They'll imagine the doctors and maybe they weren't there. Um, So he could be he could be manipulating the truth there. Um, the other thing he says, the final thing he says is that, uh, again, it just has to do with like Fuller's like right here, Fuller is like in total control and he's just making ad hoc decisions, uh, on the, on the spur of the moment. And he's going back and forth, villain, friend, villain, friend. Uh, he says that is not the way it's done. They say they play villain until the subject becomes compliant and then it stops, like the torture just absolutely stops uh, the moment they they show any sign of compliance. A lot of that I could believe. What I think is interesting is that uh, the CIA here, like they're not denying that war- waterboarding happened. Um, they are, of course, quick to mention that the uh, you know they were told by the Defense Department that this was okay and that it it wasn't a war crime. Uh, one thing I absolutely do believe, I forget, I forget her name, but, uh, at some point we got this one, uh, female head of the CIA and she had to be, you know, she had to run through her congressional interviews kind of stuff and, uh, answer a lot of these questions. And everything that I heard about her was basically like the reason she'd been put up by the CIA for this position was because she absolutely did know what, what had happened and she was 100% committed to making sure that it never happened again. Um, Because I don't think, I don't think the CIA liked being put in this position uh, in this public position as torturers uh, one bit. Uh, I only found out, I only found out just like an hour ago. Uh, did you know that the, uh, Congress, the, the intelligence committee or whatever, they, they launched an investigation against Bigelow, uh, and, and the guy that she used as her source for a lot of this stuff. Hmm. So end of the day, 
I think some really shitty things happened. I don't think they were as shitty or as dirty and violent as what we see in the film. Because I think, you know, if here's my main thinking on this. If this if this prisoner is such incredibly high value to you, you do not risk killing them. You do not risk frightening them like so far out of their wits that they cannot give you actionable intelligence. So um, I don't you know, I can't say that I know the answers, but this is just like what I choose to believe. I think it was done more clinically. And what I find interesting and the movie doesn't pursue this. But they show from the very beginning the intelligence from that farmer and others that <laughs> Bin Laden is in Tora Bora, and they ignore it. And they never – then afterwards, they never follow up on that, which I think is odd because he was, in fact, in Tora Bora. And we may have been able to nail him there if we follow that intelligence. And I just find it really – strange that on several occasions they talk about that and the ISI which is the Pakistani intelligence agency that we knew in the 20 years we were there could never be trusted because they played a dull, double game with us and the Tal Taliban um, but they never follow up on that they never they make a big deal about saying Tora Bora Tora Bora what does that mean but they never throughout the whole movie say yes he was there and we fucked up and we didn't follow that up. That, to me, was glaring and interesting. And the biggest tradecraft fuck up of all, that we didn't follow that intelligence. I don't actually remember seeing that in the movie, but I'll take your, I'll take your word for it. In the very beginning, um, they're talking about that diamond shaped. When they found that diamond shaped and a person around him and so who's, on. Who, who's in the conversation here? You say they're that's my... All Oh, so this is, Maya. Wait, this is right. Maya Fuller and the Texan lady sitting around the table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're all sitting in there. And then she makes that comment that was pre nine 11 behavior and all that stuff. And they kind of raise their eyebrows at her on that. Right. So you're well, talking about the fact that like the idea, everyone had the idea that he was hiding in a cave in the Hills. Like everyone, I remember that that was like the, the, in the zeitgeist, he was, you know, though. he was though. And Fuller discounts it and poo poos it. And it says, and comes right out and says it's bullshit. And then he goes further and says, I'll have my ISI look into it, which we know they can't be trusted because that's the Pakistani. And they're the ones that allow not only Bin Laden, but the Taliban to go back and forth across the border to seek refuge. So I just found it strange that they give us that in the beginning, but they never do anything later on to say, yeah, that's where he was. And that's how he got into a bed, a bed, a bed or whatever it was. And so I just thought that was funny that they just left that and I didn't follow it up. In the movie. Right. So help me out a little th though. So Tora Bora, I, I didn't, I never quite exactly got my head around like what that was or the significance it's of it. A cave was that a on the borderline between Afghanistan and Pakistan, okay. which where he was in fact, holed up. And there are, there are operatives to this day that said, <laughs> if we had pursued that intelligence, we would have nailed him. And it happened at the exact time that we pivoted, George Bush pivoted and started the war and sent men and resources to Iraq, which had no connection oh to the 9-11 attack. Yeah, no shit. Okay, in fact, so, mm -hmm. in fact you know, they, they, they humiliated um, Colin Paolo. They put him before that UN committee. Shameful. To talk about that yellow cake uranium, which was bullshit. And he, it went against his better judgment, you know, to say that there was a connection between Al-Qaeda and 9-11. There was not. And the ir irony of it all, and a great example of a self-fulfilled prophecy is, Al-Qaeda wouldn't go to Iraq until we went there. <laughs> yes, Al-Qaeda went after we went there. Right. You know? Can I tell you what my, can I tell you what my theory was at the time? Uh, my, my theory of the, the WMDs in Iraq, because we had spent so much time as Saddam Hussein's friend and benefactor, uh, 
I was starting to believe, I no longer believe it now, but at the time, my thought was, I think we, I think the US government was so certain that he had weapons of mass destruction because I think we had supplied them to him. We did with the the gas, the poison gas we had uh, supplied him with. Right. So we were like, okay, so where, where where is it, buddy? (laughs) We distinctly remember giving it to you. Right. Well, not, it wasn't just even the WMD. The whole Bush-Cheney lie was that there was a connection between Iraq and 9-11, and there was not. And my point is, when we diverted, when we started a war on another front, you never do that. I mean, Hitler made that mistake in World War II. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he had Europe con- conquered, and he was trying to put pressure on the British. They had like two planes left with the Royal Air Force. And instead of keeping the same pressure on the British, he stupidly did what Napoleon did and said, okay, I'll just attack Russia. Right? And started hey, a war on a second front. Yeah, right. I'm some, glad I he did it free. because it, it I got some in free a way, time. I'm glad he did it because it it was the so the seed of his demise. But that's what Bush did. So my point is we might have not only had him, but we might have wrapped up that whole conflict a bit earlier if we didn't start that unnecessary war in Iraq that had no connection to the 9-11 attack. All right. So I want to bring, so with Tora Bora in mind, I can circle back to our guy, uh, Ahmad, our, our torture victim, <laughs> who's who's about to exit stage left. He's, he's about to no longer become any part of the story. Although as far as I know, he's still in Guantanamo to, to this day. Um, let's see, where was this? Oh Yeah. Uh, Because one of the things he mentioned is like we were trying, like me and my uncle, we were trying to get to Tora Bora, uh, you know, but we couldn't because I guess like the heat was just uh, on too much uh, on that. There's another. Yeah, there's another example of the fact that he was there. And he gives a name. I I forget exactly the name that he he gives in the movie, Uh, but. One of my best tradecraft and, and and plus spy points is, you know, he gives this name and she says, oh, come on, buddy. Like, I know, I know Arabic, uh, you know, I know, I know Muslim name. I know the difference between a war name and a family name. Family, family name. Right. right. And, and I went in, I, when I started looking into this, I, I, I just, I learned something really interesting, which I want to share with the class. Uh, this is something called a cunha. Um, and a cunha is uh, an Arabic kind of kind of thing where they give someone a name, like your name changes. I forget. There's a specific term for this. It's actually, let me grab it real quick. It's so fascinating. Uh, the word is, it's a technonym. A technonym is a name that's given to you, like based like on events. A, a, a regular example of this is like uh, in some cultures, when you have a son, if you're a man and you have a son, your no, your name is no longer your name. Your name becomes the father of my son. So, like, I think if the Russians, my, yeah, I, th- I think the Russians do something like that. It's it's crazy yeah. cool. Um, yeah. so yeah, so if I, if my name was Abdul and I gave birth to a name, uh, a, a man named Jim, my name would no longer be Abdul. My name would now be father of Jim, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. to put it kind of clumsily. Um, what happens here too is though that, uh, it could also be a descriptor of, like a, a, a personality quirk of yourself or, or something that you want to express about yourself. And this becomes, this actually becomes your name. And I don't know if she's using the right term when she says war name here, but your family name is always your family name. But in, according to, again, like, I don't want to, I do not want to pretend to be an expert just based on, you know, my 15 minutes of research on this, but I, I just think it's fascinating. Um, especially in trade, we're going to get to the tradecraft part of it. So your name could become, uh, uh, the father of cats because you love cats or something. Uh, Abu 
a b u particular that that means like the father of father yeah right so if if you were especially known for loving camels your name might change to the the father of camels um let me give you an example real quick uh osama bin laden's kunya was abu abdullah abdullah is servants of god abu is father so osama styled himself as like his kunya was the father of the servants of god no ego there right <laughs> um but what also happened was uh uh, amongst Arab guerrillas and clandestine operators, they would use these kunyas to disguise their identities. They would create false kunyas. Nam de Guires. Exactly. Exactly. And because the practice is so prevalent, from what I've read, of being able to change your name of what everyone refers you to and everyone knows you as as being totally separate from your family name, that's absolutely fucking tradecraft. They should act, absolutely yeah, take advantage right. of that. But uh, this is where, this is where <laughs> the CIA has always looked for folks who are expert in languages for obvious reasons, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I remember reading many years ago that they were suspect of folks who were um, expert in Arabic because they didn't trust them. Now, I don't know if that's changed. That makes but sense those to me. are the ones, right, those are the ones you want to be able to delineate the kind of thing that you're talking about. Not just Arabic language, but the whole idea between the family name and uh, Nam de Guires and so on. Just but I had she... read, yeah, Sorry. I had read Sorry. that they were suspect of the Arabic speaking folks because they were suspicious of their allegiances now i'm hoping that's changed but i had read that somewhere i don't know if new york times or whatever so yeah that's important you know i never got to mention how much i was impressed by uh uh in the old man of how the the young uh what was his name dan we called him dan something chase chase dan chase dan I never got to mention, like, you know, I, I heard a lot of critics saying, like, he was a shitty actor in that. I, I thought he did fine. But, like, I just yeah. wanted to put a pin on, like, I don't know if he actually speaks Arabic or if he was delivering all those lines phonetically, but he fucking nailed it. Yeah. Like, he yeah. 100% made me believe that uh, he spoke fluent Arabic. But, um, yeah. So, and, and, yeah. And so, was a legend. And was a legend, right? Uh-huh. Because like I had said before, so many times the, the CIA tries to create these legends and they don't exist. He literally was. I forgot what it was, but he had that Kaiser Soze reputation to that name because he was a badass in those mountains. Hmm. Uh, these are these are she's getting reports. It looks like from people, uh, you know, partners all around the globe. Um you know, the this, this Saudis might have someone in holding. Uh, I think there was some guy in a, a European country. I don't remember exactly uh, the one. But uh, the the fact that I like seeing this level of detail of uh, analysis and corroboration to, to really, like, uh, start believing that this Abu Ahmed name well, is an important to me one. To me, the larger point is this, and I think I know I said this to you. Her, Maya's complete tradecraft, everything she does in my number, is her tradecraft is based on analyzing her opponent's tradecraft. Every single thing is her, and I point that out in every single one of my, in fact, I even added fourth tradecraft, presumptuous as that is. Every single bit of her tradecraft is interpreting what her opponents do. Every single one, which I think is interesting. Yeah. Every um, single one. Now, uh, as, as far as Cunhas go, like this Abu Ahmed is a Cunha. Uh, our guy Amar uh, successfully deflects, you know, to their satisfaction that he doesn't know the guy's actual family name. They're going to need that. Um, but... One name he can't 
you know, disguise is of course the name of his uncle, um, who Amar is considered a key lieutenant to. And, and his uncle, I don't think I have his name available uh, in front of me right now. Uh, definitely, definitely one of the inner circle of Osama bin Laden. Um, so yes, I like the, you know, again, plus five points for all the analysis and the corroboration, huge plus five points. I, I, I might end up sounding like a broken record by the end of this show of talking about like how much I appreciate this operation being shown as being decades long. I've never seen this before in a spy movie. I've never seen this before in a spy movie. The closest mm-hmm. might be a uh, uh, spy Sorge uh, might've covered like that kind of, kind of period of time. Um, mm-hmm. Do you know Sorge? Uh, no. Oh, Soviet agent that uh, infiltrated uh, Japan during world oh. war two. Uh, and got in close with them because uh, Stalin Stalin was very very afraid of the idea that uh, Japan would attack him from that side at the same time mm-hmm. that uh, Hitler attacked him. It's a it's a it's 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 great history. I didn't love the movie too much. I thought it was a little dry. This is much better in in terms of accuracy. Real quick, too, let's take a look. What are the other films that we've covered on this podcast that are that are historically based? Um, man, there's not too many. <clears throat> Spy Sorge is one. The Battle of Algiers is another oh, yeah. very fine film. Yeah. Ar- Argo. Munich. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The Good Shepherd. I s- mm. kinda, kinda. <laughs> um, let's see. And of course, where eagles dare. Obviously, a documentary. Uh, <laughs> Alistair McLean. <laughs> Alistair McLean was the author to that. I, Ooh, I don't. He did a bunch of. I don't. He remember. authored that. Probably he made a lot of. He wrote a lot of books that were all pretty much the same book. Uh, with you know, just, but yeah, lots lots of that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah. Uh, oh wait, Casino Royale. Yeah, so I guess I, I guess this is only a handful. I guess this is our fifth, uh, well, yeah. his, his historically based uh, spy film. I think it soars above all the others that we've covered in terms of giving me a sense of of the reality of of long term uh, intelligence operations. Um, she's got to go interrogate the guy they they pulled up in Poland. That was another guy. Uh, that that they needed to talk about talk to, and um, I don't I don't remember why I wrote this note, but they needed to ask him something to see if he's telling the truth. And again, it had to do with families. It had to do with families. So yeah. again, she's got the name Abu Ahmed on another channel. On another channel, uh, this Texan lady, and I hope I hope she's actually Texan. That's the accent I get off of her. Um, mm-hmm. Let me see if I can grab her name real quick. Was it Debbie Stone? Uh, or Jessica no, Debbie's, Carly? Yeah, it was Jessica. Debbie was the one that came to her about that Moroccan intelligence that got oh, okay. lost in the shuffle, right? Which was right. extremely important and helped her go on about those that they had the wrong guy, that there were uh, eight brothers, three of which went to Afghanistan and grew beards. And then they realized they had the wrong one. Uh-huh. Uh, the picture they had, uh, Saeed. And then they realized too, and this is more, this is more Maya taking their trade graph and developing into her when they said there would have been more if he, if, if Abu Ahmad really died, there would have been more noise in the chat rooms about that, right? 
And that right. when that Debbie came to her with that Moroccan intelligence that got lost in the shuffle, that's when things started to move. That's right. And it, it seems like good tradecraft on the part of, of this family of this Abu Ahmed character is like, uh, you know, he, he's smart enough to realize that a lot of us look the same to Americans. Yeah. So if I have a brother, if I have a brother that's dead and I just start using his name, uh, to right. move around then uh, then, you know, I can pin all that on him and, and that's great that she, uh, figures that mm-hmm. out uh again more more use of cunhas in the in their uh, uh counterintelligence efforts on the part of al-qaeda uh the texan lady though uh i do want to grab her name real quick uh jessica carly uh again not not her real name but supposedly based on a real person uh, she had uh, a line in on a doctor named Balawi and knew that he, this is what I'm talking about here is I'm leading up to the part where uh, uh, Carly thinks she's got someone that's going to talk and, and she's pretty confident about how much money they're offering him uh, and, and ends up with the base being... Or, or several people being killed uh, by the guy that comes into the base. Um, yeah. I thought that, I mean, just, I'll just share it like as an audience member, like just watching that scene come up, like it was screaming to me, something's going to go wrong. Like there was no point at which I, as an audience member was fooled into thinking like, this is going to work out. Um, it just looked yeah, really because- cool to me. Yeah, and and one of the things her little almost little girl enthusiasm about it, almost jumping up and down and making a cake, right? Making um, a cake, that's right. And and yeah. even Chastain says, "Hey, they don't they don't right. have birthday cakes," and you know, yeah. and she's like, "Whatever, I, 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 every everyone likes yeah. cake." I think that's the case of where her enthusiasm <laughs> got the better of her professionalism, because she told 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 those guys to stand down too, which which didn't sound right to them, the guards, you know, out front. Very much so. And again, that that incident did happen. And I have right. again, I remember. I've, I remember I've seen it. I've seen I've seen and read several uh CIA people uh who knew that lady uh describe that portrayal of her as being um, you know, that overconfident in herself as being unfair. But of course that's what you're going to say about a dead colleague. Right. Uh, and that was know. like the worst attack on a worst or second worst attack of an, on a CIA taking out so many CIA agents at one time. It's, yeah, it says it was the uh, the worst the worst in decades or just the worst. Uh-huh. I yeah. forget. Yeah, I don't understand why they didn't meet the car outside the base. Uh-huh. Uh, I think uh, Carly and and just one one Marine you know, go yeah. out and, and meet the car outside the base. Uh, I wanted to also, though, or imagine the reason for the bombing. So this is so. Oh, and also in reality, um, this wasn't their first meeting like this. This incident, uh, what what happened in reality was she had actually had con- uh, contact with him over like months and months and months that he was feeding them information and he had gained their trust. So that's how in reality he got into the compound was because they had established trust. So plus five points for him in reality, even though we don't get to see that in this film. So it kind of doesn't count. Um, But uh, I wanted to imagine the reason for the bombing on Al Qaeda's part. Um, So clearly the doctor has told his Al Qaeda masters, you know, his superiors about the contact that he's had with Carly. And so I'm trying to put myself into the head of Al Qaeda for a moment. I'm trying to play red team, uh, as red team, as Al Qaeda, I think like, okay, this team is getting too close to us, too close. They're starting to figure things out. But one thing I always say in, 
you know, uh, a lot of situations where like, as soon as you find out someone that's, um, feeding you information and that you're is, is working for the enemy team without telling you, I don't think you kill them. You don't actually, you don't kill them. You start using them to feed them misinformation back down the pipeline. And you use that situation. Unless I'll, they looked at that target and saw how many they could take out, which they in fact did. Right. But that might've over, override. Sure. Yeah. Sure. But you tell me what, what does that accomplish for me? If I'm Al Qaeda, if you're advising me, if I'm thinking about bombing that place, you know, if I'm, if I'm seeing an opportunity to take out, uh, you know, X number, let's say, let's say optimistically, maybe I kill 16 CIA people. Well, you right? said that you, they were realizing they were getting close. So sure. I, don't know. I, I guess that could have gone either way. You know, they're getting close. So let's reel them in a little bit more or let's take them out now while we can. I don't know. I guess it could go either way. I think it's counterproductive. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's a it's a good idea. I think that would confirm more than it uh, confirmed to the CIA. Like, I want to imagine or I'm trying to imagine Al Qaeda as being able to get into the mind of Washington, which they probably really can't on some on some level and, and realize just what a huge moving bureaucracy that they're dealing with. You know, if I kill 16 CIA operatives that are t the tip of the spear, that's not going to like really blunt the CIA operations. That's just going to confirm that they were on the right track. So I think that might be Cold War rationalization, too. It's a different game. With on, on, OK, so it, I'm again, I'm playing red team. Do you think that's Cold War rationalization on my part or on Washington's part? Your part. Okay. Because it's the Russians, both when when the Russians and the Americans were playing that Cold War game, they're relatively predictable. This was a whole new thing, you know, with suicide bombing. And I think you're giving them more rational credit. Um, I think they saw this as a target that was an easy target that they could take out that ended up historically being one of the biggest hits. And they, they just did it. And... I, I guess I get that Al Qaeda is very much into sim symbolic victories, you know, that they'll take a symbolic victory more than a practical victory. Like they might weight those differently than I would, but just overall, I don't think that attack did anything except like send a signal and maybe create like uh, some, you know, some rah, rah, rah amongst their troops. Uh, I think I think that bombing hurt them more than it helped them. Yeah, that very well could be. All right. So now that we get to see the example in the movie of uh, an intelligence mistake, uh, we move on to another section of the movie where we do get to. Uh, okay, so uh, like like you said, like at at some point, Saudi intelligence told sent word that the Abu Ahmed character uh, was dead, and that you're you know you were chasing a ghost, you were wasting your time, blah blah blah. Um, but uh, Moroccan, I think it was Moroccan. Okay, right? I thought it was Saudi, but I'll go with Moroccan. Um, no, because that's when Debbie Debbie comes to Maya. Right. And tells her that this was Moroccan intelligence that we just it got lost in the shuffle. And they took another look at it. And that was the, then when the whole thing about the, the eight brothers, three of which three of mm -hmm. which went to Afghanistan and grew beards. You know, and we thought we got the right one, but it was Saeed. We had the wrong picture and so on. Right. I see that so there was a meeting. Yeah, there's a meeting in Islamabad. And I, I want to read your note to you that, that I've got in the notes here and then ask you to explain it. Uh, Maya tells Jessica she thinks it's a good thing that Faraj lied. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. the fact, how, how does that work yeah. for you? Okay. Because she feels that legitimizes uh, the fact that uh, 
Farij, withheld Ahmed, Abu Ahmed, means it's revealing because the only other thing that Farij lied about was the location of Bin Laden. So the fact that she thinks that it's a good thing he lied is more her, again, analyzing that tradecraft and then applying it to her tradecraft. That was my third best tradecraft along the theme of everything Maya does is interpretive of the opponent's tradecraft. And that was another one. You see what I'm saying? She's saying that she thinks it's a good thing that Fareed lied because that proves th that's revealing because the only other thing he lied about was location of Bin Laden. I like it. I like that a lot. Right. You, you put that on your, on your list of top three, three. That's my I, third I, best trick. Because like it, it. it also, it also that's falls into the theme. I put right in the top of that. Every positive tradecraft that Maya does is based on her opponent's behavior and how she analyzes it and then goes forward. Every single one. Yeah. Yeah. And that's my third best. What about this next one? Um, when you say uh, Debbie gives Maya one of 10 names that were on a watch list, Ibrahim Saeed was given them to the Moroccans after 9-11. Yeah. That's that whole Moroccan intelligence that got lost in the shuffle where there were eight brothers, three of which went to Afghanistan and grew beards. And that's what, the, what they came up with, the fact that they got the wrong one. And that's when, uh, that's when Maya wants to get the phone number of Saeed. And she calls Fuller, and Fuller calls the guy that gets the money for the Lamborghini to get the Kuwaiti guy to get the number of Saeed. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once she has that, she's like, she calls Dan, who who has moved to Washington at this point. Uh, fun, fun stuff. Uh, you know, conversation they had at the end of the torture sequence was when he told her he was going to go to Washington and he just said like, I just, you know, she's like, are you all right? He's like, yeah, I'm all right. I just like need to go someplace where I don't see naked men like every day. <laughs> I need to go do something normal for a change. I have a, I have a problem with that. I have a oh. real, real Bring problem it. with that. Bring yeah. it to the table, Mr. Kennedy. All right. <laughs> And I wrote it down here. This statement by Fuller is troubling to me because it doesn't seem to exhibit any guilt on his part concerning the morality of torture. His main concern is the self-serving reality that because politics is changing, you don't want to be the last one holding the dog leash when the Senate committee comes in. Which not is that a there fucking was great line, by the way. Not that there was anything morally wrong with a dog leash on a human being, but that it would be incriminating evidence in the Senate. So I have a problem with that. I feel he it's a self-serving way of avoiding the political carnage that would come. I don't see any guilt in that, that it was anything morally wrong. Um, he's just worried about saving his ass and warning her about it too. That's the pro the problem I had with that. I agree. I mean, I agree. If that gets your if that gets your heat up, like that's that's totally fine with me. Well, I mean, I, that's how it sounded to me. I don't see I don't see any heroes or villains in this film. To be honest, uh, I just I see. See, but I didn't I didn't see any remorse on his part about mm -hmm. that um, about what he did with regard to that torture. And it's just a matter of let's get out of this to save my ass. So I'm not, or you're not the last one holding the dog collar. Not that there was anything wrong with putting a dollar dog collar on a human being. That's my problem with that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, he does, uh, he does trust her enough and he's got his Washington contacts enough to, uh, uh, take her, information over to get the money from uh the wolf yeah. right mm -hmm. uh who's the wolf exactly yeah this is mysterious kind of um nsa kind of guy you would you would call him an oracle kind of a guy <laughs> oh, okay so he you wasn't know, a pa um, he wasn't a pakistani he was an, a, an no American? but they 
Yeah, but they because I remember there's there's the one scene of Fuller uh, visiting walks in on him with a prayer the, rug. Yeah, yeah, and he's folding it up. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. the wolf. Yeah. That was the wolf. Oh, okay. So he was Islamic, but he was on our side. Oh, I see. Code name. Um. So yeah, just just a phone number, a Lamborghini for a phone number. Man, we are spending some fucking money here, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. But uh, that phone number. So what? And the phone number they want. So now that they uh have. Or now that she's got a theory, she's connected Abu Ahmed to, uh, which is a, a Cunha. To Saeed, what? the Saeed family. To the Saeed family. So she's converted. She thinks she has. I mean, she correctly has, but she doesn't know it yet. Converted uh, a Cunha into an actual family name. And once you know the family name, you can track all the family. And Ahmed's mother lives in Kuwait. And so that's well, he where lies. they... Right. Yeah, he lies li- to her. Lies about, who, who lies to who? About his, he lies to his mother. Oh, about right. His that's one of the most important, yeah, bits of yeah. intelligence, which which I loved. Um, so now that they've got, uh, they can uh, just listen in on uh, his mother's phone stuff. Just watching the patterns again, this is another great example of how like, you know, like all the intelligence officials and law enforcement officials that I hear about, they always talk about how like, we're not listening on on your conversations. Actually, your conversations are shit to us. Like that, that's not valuable. It's the metadata. It's the time and the place. It's the time. That was your point in the old man with um, Lithgow talking to yes. Chase. That was your point yes. about, yeah. yeah, that was your same point. Yeah. Yeah. It's the times yeah. and the places. And, and this part, this part of the film where they go into this, this section is even cause uh, e- the film kind of uh, gives us a, a little description of each of its section. This one is actually called Tradecraft, And this is where yeah. they start. Yeah. Following up mm-hmm. on the mother. And, it's, and, sh- and that's, yeah, that's my second best trade of Maya's. And again, it goes to my theme of her trade graph being based on their trade craft. Her interpretation of Saeed's concealment trade craft, where over the course of two months, he's called from six different pay phones from two different cities, never using the same phone twice, which is revealing to the point where it convinces Larry of Ground Branch to help locate him. Remember, she had to go to him and uh, pressure him. And the fact that he's too smart to talk ops on the phone and if you ever, if you ever want, I mean, this is a complicated movie and story, okay? But if you ever had to sum it up, it goes back, and I thought this was interesting. Maya's abbreviated explanation to the Navy SEAL Justin, who's played by, um, what's his name, who was in all Pratt. those Jurassic Park? Chris Pratt. Yeah. She sums it up to him when he wants to know how she knows it's Bin Laden when she says... And I think this sums it up perfectly, and it's enough for him. Bin Laden uses a courier to interact with the outside world, and by locating the courier, we located Bin Laden. Boom. That's it. That's exactly a brief summation of her tradecraft. Once they figure out he had a courier, they were all over it. And that was them running through the streets in Pakistan trying to track him down. But I thought... That stood out to me when she said to him, and that was all uh-huh. he needed, right? Bin Laden used a courier, uses a courier to interact with the outside world, and by locating the courier, we've located him. Boom. That sums it up. And that was my second best tradecraft. Awesome. I really loved that little detail, too, about the fact they noticed, like, he, when he does call his mother, he lies to her about where he is. Yeah. I, I, think, I yeah. think that's fantastic so uh they're they're using great tradecraft but this also folds into your whole thing about like how the cia is so good like they can they can see trade they know tradecraft and they know it when they see it you know Mm -hmm. no matter how good it is like it it leaves a different kind of trail 
than you know a normal person's usual activities and and over time you can you can triangulate in on that like they're they actually like they get this guy not so much because he's dumb but because he's so fucking smart and they can yeah. compare his behavior his very smart behavior to other people's just normal shit and they can see the patterns i love right. it yeah i love it great stuff um and that's where you know mark strong is bringing that up too oh uh, well he, uh, okay actually that's for a little bit later that's when we get to the yeah. uh to that's the compound. best trade craft to the yeah, compound, that's my best right? yeah, yeah 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 um what about this one i got fred says maya argues with bradley yeah in the hallway there when she kind of threatens him okay i know the conversation you're talking about yeah yeah that just and then Yeah, she, the whole argument, I guess, is he thinks she's focusing too much on Bin Laden and he wants to focus on future attacks. And what does she come back and say? It's Bin Laden that's directing the, oh, yeah, because he's worried about the homeland. And he said it's Bin Laden that's orchestrating the attacks uh, the way they are right now. What was that? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, but how many how many Al Qaeda attacks were there after nine eleven? Um, I know there were several either, important ones leading up to it. She but, says, "You just want me to nail some low level mullah crackadula so you can check that box <laughs> on your resume." It says that while you're in Pakistan, you got a real terrorist. But the truth is, you don't understand Pakistan. You don't understand Al Qaeda. Either give me the team I need to follow this leader. The, other, the only other thing you're going to have on your resume is being the first station chief to be called before a congressional committee for subverting the efforts to capture or kill bin Laden. And then she asks him, oh, and that was the thing. She says that if it wasn't for him, Al Qaeda would still be focused on overseas targets. She comes back and says, if you really want to protect the homeland, you've got to kill bin Laden. Right? And right. Uh, that was her point. I'm going to... Oh, uh, let's see. I I want to I want to say something about that, but I don't want to get into deep discussion about it until the end of the podcast later in the end of the podcast. Uh can I just put a <clears throat> put a pin yeah. on this like who's who's right in this situation? Like I kind of see his point of view. Like yeah. I agree I agree with her that bin laden is an important target a valuable symbolic target for sure is he a valuable strategic target quite possibly is he valuable enough to be spending this amount of money on i am very not sure yeah, about but her that. argument her argument is more than just the optics of getting him she says if it wasn't for him, Al Qaeda would be focused on overseas targets. Right. She feels if you really want to protect the homeland, that's her argument. Well, whether it's true or not. Um, so she's more than to... just that he's a symbolic target. Right. So, so let me let me let me rephrase that in what I think you're saying, and and tell me if I've got you right or wrong. Like Maya believes that if they, uh, like the amount of pressure that they're putting on bin Laden is keeping him so far hidden in the hole that he can't be operational. And if they relax that pressure, he will then be able to be more free to be more operational. And then the attacks will come. Is yeah, that, I guess. Is that yeah. how you see yeah. her, her point of view? Uh, yeah. I think that's what she's implying. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. Um, And then, uh, yeah, and then she gets a ghost phone from a pro where now she can, uh, like, in real time, like, see, uh, you know, yeah. what, what Saeed is, is doing. Like, not just his phone calls to his mother's, but they can now see, like, all of his phone calls. And now they're really seeing, like, this guy's, like, getting crazy. Like, he's very erratic. 
uh, mm -hmm. the tracking of the cell phone signals on both sides of like the evasion of the intelligence agency on this guy's part and the relentless pursuit and analysis. Um, the fact that they can see that he's driving in circles, like now they have GPS on him. They don't just have his metadata on just the phone calls he's making to his mother. Like they can see where he is in real time. And he's just, he's just doing super crazy stuff. Uh, of course, this is when they get so close to her, uh, to him that uh, doesn't doesn't don't they try to actually bomb her or something in the in the compound, right? And then that's when the CIA guy says you're on a list. Yeah. So this is when we cross over into our next section. I think. Um, they know, like, they've taken it from the the name Abu Ahmed to the name of this particular member of the Saeed family. They're a hundred percent, like, the team is a hundred percent sure this is Bin Laden's courier, and that's when we go to politics for a bit because. And now they've got the house too, because they now that they can see where he goes, they've yeah. got the house. So, so for a bit now, uh, you know, do you see where I'm at? We're going to go into the politics final decision section, which is a stone's throw away from the ISA's version of West Point. Say that again. Sorry. The compound in the Abadadaville or wherever he is, which is uh -huh. a stone's throw away from the ISI's, Pakistan's version of West Point. Oh, so geez. it's I incredible. Didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, no, they, they do mention that in there uh, when they're talking to Gandolfini. Um, so it's just, it's just beyond belief that they didn't know he was there. But that shouldn't be a surprise because we've known for decades that the Pakistanis have been playing this double game with Afghanistan too, against their arch enemy, even India, because it's for their advantage to keep Afghanistan unstable for their um, war, ongoing hot war, cold war with India. And they have, sometimes it's hot in Kashmir, uh, let alone the Taliban and Al Qaeda. So the pa Pakistan and the ISA never to be trusted and then we find out later that uh, they scapegoat the CIA station chief, who Maya had that argument with, to go. They scapegoat him for those civilian deaths that come up. So, um, yeah, they're never to be trusted uh, along those lines. And um, for 20 yeah. years, we knew that. That wasn't even hindsight. We knew that. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna do a John Stewart real quick, a little sideline look into the camera and talk to mm -hmm. our non-existent Pakistani listeners. Here's my message to you. My first impulse from everything that I've ever heard on the news or, or, or on the internet is like, fuck Pakistan. Oh my God. You guys are just like, just seem not great partners at all. And then I want to soften that really quick and admit that I'm just I'm just a California white boy. I don't fucking know what what the hell is actually going on there. I've never been to your part of the world, and uh, I'm I'm sure there's a huge difference between the Pakistani government and some of what I would think are their bad decisions and the Pakistani people. Uh, okay, but seriously, fuck Pakistan. Um. Strong. So, okay. So they got the house. They, I mean, they have, they don't know it's the house, but this is the part where they have to like prove to Washington, this is the house, right? Um, they get, they get satellites up there. Um, I like this part where, uh, three women in the house must mean there's a third male that they're not seeing because, uh, you know, uh, Muslim women don't, you know, uh, live alone like they either live with their families or with their husbands so uh, you never see more women than men in a house that would never make sense in the CIA's 
understanding of Muslim culture of the people that they're targeting. Um, interesting though, like I just, I, I might be quibbling here. Like uh, in the final raid, I actually counted four men in the house and uh, six women. So, I mean, the ratio was correct off, but it was weird. They said there was three and three. Anyways, Mark Strong is, again, like, so now is the part where they need to push it up the ladder and make the case to the president. President's going to make a final decision here. The interlocutor, like the, the gatekeeper here, is the National Security Advisor. So Mark Strong is making it all of his case for this has got to be bin Laden. There are so many ways we've been looking at this compound. We've been uh, trying to figure out like if we could get into their trash. Can't do that. They burn it. Uh, you know, uh, we can't get a, a, a camera in there. Uh, they're so distrustful. It's so like, we even thought about putting someone in the sewer to try to like collect fecal samples and try to get a DNA match, which I don't even know what they would match that against, uh, against Osama bin Laden's DNA. Uh, but you know, he's just making the case of like all the super extreme measures that you could possibly make to figure out who is in this house. They're all being defeated by the behavior of the people in this house. And that, again, is the huge red flag. This is, which is tradecraft yeah, telling them. Which is why do. it's my number one tradecraft. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they say that this would not be a drug dealer or any other bad guy. I have down um, only a top-level Al-Qaeda operatives behave this way. The NSA had head points out that there's a 40% chance it's head of Al-Qaeda, but it could easily be a drug dealer. George points out that they can't ask anyone since the detainee program went to hell. And talk about tradecraft on the part of bin Laden and company, George relates to the NSA head all that they have tried to do only to be thwarted by burning trash for no DNA ID, which you mentioned, vaccine program to try to send in a doctor there to retrieve blood for DNA, also fails along with no phone calls from the compound. Also, the unidentified third man does not leave the compound for groceries or anything. For fresh air, he paces around under a grape arbor with leaves so thick with no satellite views. After the meeting, George approaches the NSA uh, head and points out all of this. Um, so, not only is that great trade calf, but to me, it eliminates other bad guys like drug dealers, which they kind of bring up for the sake of argument sure. around that table. So, um, and I put that down, I abbreviate it in my number one trade graph by saying this. I said, probably the best trade craft of the enemy that resulted in good trade craft for the CIA. Again, more with my theme of analyzing the bad, the bad guys uh -huh. with ours for the CIA was when observing the home of bin Laden in, in Badabad, they concluded that only a top-level al-Qaeda operative would take such extreme attempts to avoid det detention, differentiating him from drug dealers or other bad guys. So process of elimination, uh, mm. which is why Maya came up with 100% or 90 or whatever it was. Right. Yeah, and percentages is what I wanted to talk about here. And uh, just, again, plus spy points, accuracy uh, about this concept of the red team analysis this is something like as a QA professional, uh, you know, I'm, I'm often, let's see, in, in, in software publishing, the QA lead is most often uh, like my role is to be the devil's advocate. Like, uh, you know, all, all the producers, the CEOs, the developers, every, everyone wants to push the project forward. I'm supposed to be the brakes on the car. I'm supposed to make the case of why we shouldn't go. You know, we shouldn't launch this project. I, not not that my job is to like stop the project from launching at all costs, but to give all the counterfactual reasons and and really 
let people know like what the problems might be. This is what a red team analysis is. And I did some reading online here. Uh, you know, it's mentioned in, in uh, Mark Strong's briefing with the National Security Advisor. From what I read online, these are analysts that are brought in that don't have money in the game. Uh, it's a mix of multiple intelligence agencies, including the CIA, right? So even though they're trying to vet the CIA's intelligence, they're still going to have the red team and, you know, have a member of the CIA in the red team. And uh, they're going to play devil's advocate here. And according to what I read, like, you know, the final analysis, uh, different people ran between 40 and 95% certainty. And that was just two weeks before the mission. Uh, but what's, nobody... haunting, what's haunting them and hanging over their shoulders, and they bring that up, is the weapons of mass destruction bullshit that Cheney and Bush tried to foist in Colin, Colin Powell. So they do bring that up because that's hanging yes. over their head. Yes. I, I'm i so glad you let me bring that up because I, I kind of uh, skipped it over earlier. But the politics of Washington, too, like a lot of people are really gun shy because they know at this point how bad they got it wrong uh, with the Iraq invasion and the yellow cake thing and the... Uh, Colin Powell thing. And so like a lot of people are, are displayed in this movie, the Washington professionals as being like, especially want to be like way more careful than they were on this than they were on that. Nobody wants to be caught with their pants down. This is like my hugest problem with uh, American government in general and American litigious society and our blame society overall is like, but I don't want to get into that fucking tangent. Uh, but it's it's there and it's 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 expressed in here. Um, ultimately, they do pull the plug. But before they do that, here's my my here's my big minus spy points for this movie. Is uh you know they bring in uh, Tony Soprano. Uh, James Gandolfini playing Leon Panetta. He's the director of the CIA. He's finally being brought into this room to, to help them make the final decision. I really didn't like the fact that he did not seem to understand probabilities. You know, like, you know, he's looking around the room and saying like, what? Nobody fucking knows what's going on. Everyone just thinks it's a person. You know, you think it's 50%. You think it's 75%. I thought that was total bullshit. The CI director has to understand probabilities. Come on. I, that, that might be one of my worst. I, I forget. Well, I forget. But again, he's probably gun shy from the WMD horseshit too. You know, so that's probably part of it. You know, once bitten, twice shy. Yeah, but I, I, I don't know. I think your job is just to, to put all the, yeah. you know, analyst things together like you're the director of the fucking cia like right. you, can't you, be, can't, you can't be this ignorant of the yeah, idea that there's anything anything like certainty in the world right but you also can't discount politics and politics politics is in everything and i'm sure that was a big part of it mm, shit all right all right all right um Just to stop and think, stop and think about if he wasn't in there, you know, and I had mentioned that Desert One fiasco when Jimmy Carter tried to um, rescue those uh, hostages in Iran, what a clusterfuck that was and how that helicopter backed into a C-130, you know what I mean? I mean, in this case, the one helicopter at the expense of getting ahead of ourselves uh, went down, but it didn't scuttle the mission. But think about and that was probably on their minds. Think about if, if you know, he wasn't there or the mission went bad, you know. So we know it had a had a good ending, but still, you can't discount politics. It's everywhere in in everything. So especially after Iraq. Sure. So I want to describe my least, my single least favorite scene in the movie, uh, which could have been good, but I think was bad. Um. So 
James Gandolfini, the director of the CIA, he's gotten different different levels of confidence about what's going on from different people, but he has heard from one analyst that is willing to say it's 100%. And so what I like about this is that he goes and has lunch with her or he, you know, joins her in the, I don't want to say yeah. he has lunch with her, but he joins her yeah, in the lunchroom. Yeah. He wants, yeah, he wants to meet her a little bit informally and like, lo- like maybe get a read on who this person yeah. is. I think yeah. that's great. However, He asks her why she's so certain, and and he asks her if she's ever been on any other assignment, and she says, no, sir, I was recruited into the CIA at 17, and finding Osama bin Laden has been my only job for my entire career in the CIA. To me, that is Mm -hmm. a bad plot point, and that's why it's my least favorite scene in the movie because to me as the CIA director that would be a big red flag to discount her certainty because she's got everything riding on this she's obsessive with right I would, it would see make you think that she was obsessed with this and therefore not professional right I would perceive her as not being objective but instead mm-hmm. He decides that her certainty and that this is the only thing she's ever worked on. So I, I give that minus five points. I, I, I have to. Um, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I get that. I, I think it was a missed opportunity, too, because the idea of talking to her was great. But the answer she gave and the conclusion he drew did not sit well with me. Yep. Yep. Okay. I get you. Um, wow. I think we might be done with the trade craft here because, uh, you know, the next 20 minutes of the movie are, you know, a very well-directed action piece. Um, I don't, I don't see a lot of trade craft that we need to talk about. Oh, I do have one. I do have one I can mention. Uh, I love this when, once they've, uh, established control and gotten the kill uh they they get the command to commence sse and i looked that up and that is sensitive site exploitation meaning the retrieval of documents materials and persons from a location that could provide military intelligence and we get to see them doing that that's when they're like grab the fucking hard drives don't leave any hard drives fucking papers you know uh Obviously, the body of Bin Laden, um, and and all of that. But um, other than that, oh, and I might say I might take a moment to say that, uh, even though because it's not the focus of this show to talk about you know um, action scenes, but I really thought this one was another example of really brilliant directing. It is a really difficult job to put together like a team of like 20 people that all have their faces obscured. So you can't see what actor is saying what lines over a 20 minute period. And at no point did I lose track of like where people were or what they were doing. Really good shit. I thought it was almost eerie. I had the names of all the men and they kept whispering the names as they would went down the hall, right down to Osama, Osama. Oh, I thought yeah. that was almost eerie. That was you know? cool. That was cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, if, uh, if, if you're with me, which I think we're done talking about like the events of the movie, I, I do want to take a little bit of time talking about blowback in general uh the this is a movie about the death of bin laden and just in the last month uh you know he was the first leader of al qaeda he was the founder of al qaeda uh i know that we killed his successor 
And now just in the last month, we've killed that man's successor, um, Zawahiri. So this is a, this is a moment where I, I, I have some thoughts. I want to, uh, you can invite me to go for, actually, I'll fucking, I'll just go first. But I do want to hear your thoughts about like the, the value of, I mean, so it's a successful mission, but what does it accomplish? I mentioned before, I do see Maya's point of, you know, maybe if we uh, are not putting this much pressure around him, then he could operate more uh, openly, and that would open us up to future attacks. I see that strategic advantage. Overall, I kind of feel like we spent too much money on Osama bin Laden. I didn't actually think he was that important of a kill. Um, the guy we just killed also was, you know, Zawahiri. Uh, he was Osama bin Laden's doctor, for for example, uh, long ago. Uh, definitely was like out there on the social media as a rah, rah, rah. He's a big symbolic figure of Al Qaeda. But I think that Al Qaeda is, again, like, for a long time now been reduced to a brand or maybe reduced is not the right word it's more like you like you smash the cockroach nest and the cockroach is like just spread out into a bunch of places and maybe they're more dangerous to the united states and the western world and to democracy as a brand than they are as an operational force but uh, I've heard from at least one analyst that I find credible that think that killing Zawahiri, who was largely, from what I've heard, largely considered as very incompetent and not capable of planning any kind of great stuff, that uh, we've we've left a vacuum for two. There's two guys. We, we don't know exactly which one is going to take over the mantle of Al-Qaeda, but both of them are considered by uh, U.S. intelligence as being far more competent than Zawahiri. Your thoughts? I look at a, at a larger position, larger point. The world understood why we invaded Afghanistan, right? It had turned into a terrorist camp, camp headed by Osama bin Laden, who was a Saudi, okay? When we pivoted, right, and started a war on a second front in Iraq that had no connection to 9-11, even though the Bush administration tried to make that point, it took our eyes off the ball, not only in Tora Bora, with, but with Afghanistan itself, okay? Everything I've heard from Robert have said that we had him hold up there. And then when we made that pivot and went to Iraq, it allowed him to escape over the border, right? So not only am I thinking that we may have nailed him and wrapped up our involvement there before it turned into, I'm thinking, our 20-year involvement there in Afghanistan. Oh, uh, you think right? if Tora Bora had been successful, then we could have avoided maybe, that? Maybe, maybe, wow. maybe, maybe, maybe. Okay. I'm thinking that our 20-year involvement there, uh, the saw us repeat the same old mistake of occupying forces when we see counterinsurgency constantly morph into the dreaded mission creep of nation building and maybe just maybe if we didn't take our eyes off the ball there to start an unrelated war in iraq that might have also helped us wrap things up there without the distraction of having a war on two fronts okay because think about that <laughs> what happened in iraq right we ended up after we got out of there right we ended up basically having completely destabilizing the powers, the whole powers of the Middle East, to the fact that now Iraq is in Iran's sphere of influence. Hussein, right? the Hussein, Hussein was holding the house together. Right. He, was a, he was a load-bearing dictator. He was keeping those, <laughs> right. He was keeping all of those factions under his thumb, right? Mm -hmm. And then when we got rid of him, it, it just exploded, not unlike what happened in Yugoslavia when Marshal Tito left. All those factions started to attack each other. And then it blew up. 
But my point is, too, it had the exact opposite effect because it totally upset the balance of power into the Middle East to the point where now Iraq is more in the sphere of influence of Iran than they ever were. Okay? So the whole pivot, when he took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan to attack Iraq under the false pretense that al-Qaeda was there, really not only messed up, I think, our chance of getting bin Laden earlier, but also possibly wrapping up our mission there in Afghanistan so it didn't turn into mission creep and nation building. But it wouldn't have blown up Iraq to what it is now, which is more of a threat to us. So I look at the whole thing as pretty much disastrous. Um, and the whole thing about starting a war on a two front, which any soldier or military person, you never want to do. And that's what it was. It became a war on two fronts. We were distracted uh, by Iraq. And uh, I'm thinking that maybe we would have wrapped things up rather than have that 20 year old forever war that we had in in Afghanistan if we just uh, didn't start that war on the second front, which took men and resources away from Afghanistan to yeah. a completely unrelated and unnecessary war in Iraq. Agents, please report for debriefing on this operation. The director will see you now. Let's debrief this movie, give it a star rating, and uh, we, we get to we get to give our separate star ratings, but then... Uh, we kind of have to come to a consensus on the on the tradecraft uh, uh, on the park bench rating in this podcast. I often kind of weight my star rating on uh, again. It's just how much I personally enjoy this film. In this case, I'm going to step out of that and I'm going to say like how important this film is to see at least once yeah. for other people. I'm going to call it a five. I think it's aged well. I think it ages better the long. I think it was a good movie when it came out. I think it's a better movie today. I think it's a movie that ages like 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 fine wine. I think it just gets gets better and better. Um, I want to note that this film came out in theaters before streaming happened. I think this is a much better watch in the living room than it was in the theater. That was my experience of it anyways, because yeah, because you can't pause it in the theater. Right. And like, I feel like in the living room, you have time to like, think more deeply about like, what is going on. And again, like you said, like pause it, if you need it, maybe Google something, if you I need did a to. lot of that, right. I'm taking notes. I mean, it was good in the theater. I think it was way better in the living room. Okay. I could never give it a five because of the torture uh, waterboarding part of it. Like we talked about that before and how she kind of wanted it both ways by suggesting that it did yield intelligence when we have other sources say that it didn't um, and how bad it made us feel. Uh, I could never give it a five because of that. Um, very bad tradecraft. And she doesn't really make a stand on it because like I say, she wants it both ways. And we don't know if in fact it did yield the intelligence a la Jack Bauer in 24, you know? Um, so I could never give it a five. I think it was very well done, but because of the torture, I couldn't go there. All right. Really quick uh, reminders of our um, worst and best. Uh, my worst tradecraft. Uh, the, during the interrogation, the way that Dan Fuller focuses on the next attack, he's always assuming there's going to be a next attack. Instead of trying to gather information of what this guy knows, the assumption that there's going to be a next attack, bad tradecraft. Uh, Al-Qaeda's bomb on the base, I give that minus buy points for both sides. Um, it was handled badly on the CIA's part, and I don't think that Al-Qaeda actually accomplished, like I think they lost more than they won with that bombing. My number one worst tradecraft is the idea that, uh, you know, our stand in for Leon Panetta doesn't understand probabilities. That's fucking garbage. Fred, you're, you're worst. Okay. My worst tradecraft, it, my, it's number three. 
or the first one? Three, three, two, and then one. Okay. Uh, my number three is um, our over-reliance on the Pakistani intelligence organization known as ISI. And this is not just hindsight because we've always known that they play a double or triple game playing us against the, not only the Taliban, but also India, who is their arch rival and keeping Afghanistan a, unstable has been their intent or interest against India. They have an on again, off again, hot war with India regarding Kashmir. And we've always known that they've supported the Taliban and allowed them escape and refuge across the border for the entire 20 years we've spent in Afghanistan. In the movie, it was illustrated by ISI's manipulation of Station Chief Bradley to the point of his dismissal to Dan's naive reliance for them, ISI, to check on that farmer in Tora Bora. That's number three. My next worst tradecraft is the intelligence we ignored from that farmer in Tora Bora who reported seeing a diamond-shaped pattern in the hills of a tall man in the center flanked by four guards consistent with the UBLs, Osama bin Laden's movements, to an analyst telling Dan, hey boss, I got a guy for 5,000 bucks. He can set up a taxi stand and snoop around a bit. To which Dan says, no, I don't need him. The diamond sighting is bullshit. See if the PAX ISI will send someone to talk to the farmer. This of course was bad tradecraft because although it's hindsight, we find out Bin Laden was in fact hiding out in a cave in Tora Bora before he made his way across the border into Pakistan. We might've nabbed him if we acted on this intel, but instead we, took our eye off the ball there and switched manpower and resources to Iraq that had no connection to the 9-11 attack in spite of Bush and Cheney's claims that it did. My worst tradecraft is of torture and waterboarding, although to some it may be considered good tradecraft by some because in the movie we see it, quote, working in the story. However, I would argue that the long-term blowback of these practices from Abu Ghraib to Getmo has done us more harm in the eyes of the international community. And resorting to extraordinary rendition, which you haven't really talked about, where we farmed out detainees out to be tortured in countries where it's allowed also backfired and made us look bad. And as I said before, the military brass has also been against torture, waterboarding, for what it would mean for our soldiers who were captured, just like what happened to John McCain. Um, so that's my third worst. On my right. top. I'm, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Over to Todd's yeah. best tradecraft. Uh, I really like the red team analysis uh, portrayal in the film. Uh, that was my number three best. My number two best was, again, like this whole tradecraft thing about like the cell phone use and Abu's behavior and how they tracked him down, which I give plus five points to both sides. You know, I love how he was so evasive and i love how they could see that and and track him down my number one best goes to the whole cunha thing uh maybe just because i liked learning about it okay all right well again i'm going to remind everybody that um i'm going to answer the best tradecraft questions tradecraft questions this way Everything I saw about Maya's best tradecraft was from interpreting the opposition's tradecraft and then basing her conclusions on that. Every single one. So my number three, when Maya tells Jessica that she thinks it's a good thing Farij lied about Abu Ahmed because it means that Farij thinks Abu Ahmed's identity is just as important as the location of Bin Laden because that's the only other thing Farid lied about. I think that was a really good one, by the way. Good yeah. catch. My yeah. my number two best tradecraft, which again is based on Maya's analysis, Maya's interpretation of Saeed's concealment tradecraft, where over the course of two months, he's called from, and I did abbreviate this a bit, um, six different pay phones from two different cities, never using the same phone twice, which is revealing to the point where it convinces Larry of Ground Branch to help locate him. And the fact that he's too smart to talk ops on the phones. And this goes back, and this is important, I think, to Maya's abbreviated explanation to Navy SEAL Justin when he wants to know how she knows it's Bin Laden at the site when she simply says, Bin Laden uses a courier to interact with the outside world, and by locating his courier, we located Bin Laden. Which is, sums up, 
that great trade craft. My best trade craft, um, and I do abbreviate this too, uh, of Maya interpreting the tradecraft of the enemy that resulted in good tradecraft for the CIA was that when observing the home of Bin Laden in, in Abbottabad, yeah. they concluded that the only a top-level Al-Qaeda operative would take such extreme attempts to avoid det- detection, differentiating him from drug dealers or other bad guys. And I took it upon myself to add a number four because I thought this was important. Let's hear it. My own. Maya also reads into the fact that because they had no intercepts of Abu Ahmad dying, which she surmised that they'd pick up in chat rooms if someone of that importance was dead, supporting her and Debbie's theory that the picture of the three brothers they had was wrong and was that of Abu Ahmad's brothers who looked like him with a beard called Ibrahim Saeed. So I put that down as the fourth good that's, that's, that's another really good one. Uh, park bench rating for me, very difficult here, but uh, I have been thinking about it a lot. Uh, because with historical movies, like our park bench rating should be for the movie and not for the history. So whatever we know about the history, I guess... I, I guess I want to like set aside my tradecraft and now my, my park bench rating of, of these actions by U S intelligence might be lower than the rating. I'm going to give the movie. I want to give this movie a five on park benches simply because I've never seen anything that comes anywhere close to portraying intelligence operations as being decades long, involving hundreds of people, thousands of pieces of intelligence. It is so fucking good in that way. The only reason I can ding it, and I have, but I can't give it the five. I can't give it the five because I think that the portrayal of torture in the initial part is unrealistic i'm not denying that it happened i think the portrayal there is poor i'm starting with a bid of 4.5 over to you fred what do you think yeah i'd agree with that and the reason why not just the portrayal of the torture what bothers me more is the implication that it worked which is debatable right that's what it's, bothers me a bit. It's debatable, but let's say let's say for a moment let's let's use a thought experiment. Let's say this was a work of fiction. Like Jack Bauer? Like let's say <laughs> all the events here had no connection to reality. How would you rate the tradecraft in that case? Oh, the tradecraft. Yeah, I mean, I said to you the trade the positive tradecraft that she used based on what the enemy's tradecraft was 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 excellent um and the enemy's tradecraft was good as well yeah yeah really good yeah so yeah no, I, so it's yeah good i want to give it a five i'm just gonna ding it that one half a point i i'm happy to hear that you're joining me with that even yeah. though uh again like this is just our our, our uh, you know based on the movie not on reality yeah. okay, okay. Four yeah, that's well five. done wow Yep. That's well done. Protocol 9 initiated. This podcast will self-destruct in 20 seconds. The preceding transmission sampled the songs Ice Cold by Audio Nautics, Enter the Party by Kevin McLeod, and sound effects from freesound.org. Attributions and links are found at spieslikeus.net. Editing by Todd Hostetler. <laughs>